Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Buzz Bissinger. I'm an author. I've also been a writer and contributing editor to Vanity Fair for 15 years. And it really is my honor and uh, privilege to introduce uh, one of the MIPCOM keynote speakers, Dawn Ostroff. Uh, Dawn is president of Conde Nast Entertainment Group, a division created to develop filmed entertainment businesses based on Conde Nast world-class brands, articles, and personalities across all media platforms. And that, of course, includes television, feature films, and digital video. Prior to joining Condé Nast in the fall of 2011, Dawn launched and led the new CW Broadcast Network, which was a joint venture of CBS and Warner Brothers. She developed such groundbreaking hit histories as hit series as Gossip Girl, The Vampire Diaries, and America's Next Top Model. She and her team really did develop cutting edge strategies for leveraging interactive content and revenue opportunities. She has always been on the cusp of what is the new and what is the change. Before that, she was the vice president of entertainment for Lifetime Television. For five years, from 1996 to 2002, she led that network. It was sixth, and it became the first rated cable network in prime time. Now, I'm here not as a buyer, not as a seller, not as a distributor, not as a producer. And what little money I had was taken by the Hotel Martinez for coffee for two. I'm here as a storyteller. That's what I do for a living. That's what I've always done for a living. And Dawn, in addition, as I said, to always being on the edge, on the cutting edge of what is the new, also understands there will never, ever, when it comes to content, be a substitute for storytelling. It is and always will be king. Conde Nast has 124 magazines worldwide. They're read by roughly 50 million readers. Its websites reach to 80 million. We are the world's premier storytellers. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dawn. I'm proud of her. I'm proud of Vanity Fair, which is launching a French edition. And I'm particularly proud of Condé Nast. We are the world's storytellers. And before we get to Dawn, let's take a little look at what Condé Nast and Condé Nast Entertainment represents. Thanks, Buzz, and welcome, everyone. It's a privilege to be here at MIPCOM this year and in Cannes with friends and colleagues, both old and new. So I'm here today to talk to you about storytelling. And well, it may be a surprise to you, but for decades, Condé Nast magazine articles have been the source for producers for countless feature films and TV series. Now, with our new Condé Nast Entertainment Group, we're charged with bringing our stories to life in film, television, and digital content. As you all know, the film and video content business is going under an extreme makeover. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about what it really takes to make great content. Now I'd like to talk about the TV business for just a moment. I'll bet we all remember where we were the day the TV as we once knew it died. For me, it was a focus group five years ago. I was president of entertainment at the CW Television Network, one of the five US broadca national broadcasters. We wanted to see what our young audience thought about our programming schedule, and well, here's what we found out. They didn't think about our schedule. They didn't have to anymore. Thanks to DVRs, they watched our programs on their own time. The whole idea of appointment television was over. And yet, in the years since, TV has not only survived, but it's thrived. Thrived as TV has become unmoored from TV screens, allowing us to watch the Jersey Shore on the way to the Jersey Shore. Thrived as social media have created new measures of success, from Facebook likes, Twitter tweets, to check-ins on Get Glue. 
thrived as new forms of on-demand distribution have enabled new habits and volumes of consumption. In fact, this past June, Netflix subscribers watched more than one billion hours of content in a single month. Now, our industry has always been in the creative business, but now we're in the creative disruption business too. We're not just part of the technological revolution, we're actually helping to lead it and define it. Jason Keelar from Hulu have been a big part of that, so I'm thrilled that he'll be speaking here today. And let's face it, every new platform is a new opportunity for people to see our content. But here's the thing, for all the attention that we pay to new technologies and new distribution systems, what matters most is not the platform, but the content streaming across it. Because to quote from a recent article in The Hollywood Reporter, without the content, the branded channels that everyone wants, these platforms are just empty pipes. After all, what's the point of on demand if there isn't anything you really want to see? So I don't want to talk about how tomorrow's viewers are going to watch, or where they're going to watch, or when they're going to watch. We already know the answers to those questions on any screen, anywhere, anytime. The question that I'm interested in is what they're going to watch. What content are they going to seek out and select in a world where their options are virtually infinite? Already the lines are blurring between different content platforms. We see TV shows on our tablets, music videos on our smartphones, movies streaming through our Xboxes and then onto our big screens. We watch video on the New York Times website and we read articles on CNN.com. Arrested Development lived and died on Fox, and now a new season is being resurrected on Netflix. While the annoying orange, which began on YouTube, has found a second home on the Cartoon Network. Migration's happening just in all directions, but it all leads to one place. All content end up on digital platforms no matter where it was originally developed. And what does this mean for producers? Well, it means that we're all going to be swimming in the same ocean, whether we're feature film whales or digital clip minnows or something in between. The new environment is one big creative frictionless sea. And the only way to make waves in that sea is with great storytelling. Now, when it comes to stories, traditional TV and film companies may feel confident that they have no real competition given the short form relatively poor quality content that defines today's digital space, but traditional entertainment companies can't afford to be complacent lest they want to go the same way as the fax machine, the VCR, Kodak film, and dare I even say the music industry. Because the digital space is on the verge of a great leap forward, an upgrade to premium quality. And I think that we're going to see it offering better stories better told, and better produced. And part of the reason that I'm so convinced of this is because we have all been down a road like this before. Digital today reminds me of the 1980s and 90s when cable in the US was in its early days. None of the traditional broadcasters considered cable a real threat at the time. I mean, and yet why should they have? Back then in the United States, only about 20% of the households even had cable access. The prevailing theory was that viewers only wanted to graze the cable menu to see the offerings, which, which meant that a lot of the original content on cable was short. In many cases, no more than a few minutes long. At, a t at that time, who would have ever thought that all six of the last six Emmys for Best Drama would have gone to cable shows? Who would have thought that HBO, Showtime, and AMC would be the standard bearers for quality dramas and comedies. Who would have thought that media critics would credit cable with turning television into art? And who would have thought that cable would command a larger share of viewers than broadcast? Well, today, the content streaming on YouTube, music channels like Vivo and Noisy, looks a lot like MTV, which consisted mainly of music videos. Young Hollywood, a site that chronicles the lives of celebrities bears an uncanny resemblance to the early days of the E! Network. Funny or Die is like the madcap stepchild of Comedy Central's predecessors. And while the hairstyles and fashions may have changed since then, the formats 
are remarkably similar. Well, I don't think that these examples simply mimic what was. They anticipate what's next. Simply put, digital content is evolving today in much the same way that cable evolved a generation ago. When cable shifted from airing vignettes and music videos to long-form programming, and of course, a big part of that was financial. They wanted those eyeballs to stick to their channel. And likewise, YouTube will now place a greater emphasis on time spent viewing and on engagement, not just on the number of views. But let's remember the main reason that the top cable channels not only survived but thrived, simply not because they, they were supposed to switch from three minute video to 30 or 60 minutes. Cable networks succeeded because they became better storytellers. They filled their time slots with memorable shows, shows that targeted a niche and spoke to audiences that hadn't been spoken to before. These were shows that created fascinating worlds and told us to come inside. They let us be voyeurs inside these worlds that few of us, if anyone, had ever seen before. Some of these worlds are completely invented and others were utterly real. Either way, they were impossible to resist. There's the real world of aspiring designers trying to enter the cutthroat fashion industry on Project Runway, and the world where dragons live, entire kingdoms revolt, and lord and ladies play the game of thrones. But it isn't just the worlds themselves that are interesting, the people in them are too. These worlds have been populated with memorable characters unlike any we'd ever met before. Iconic characters who make us love them and hate them. Complex characters who live in many shades of gray. Characters who are totally original and yet somehow relatable too. Like the family man going through a midlife crisis while serving as the mafia don of New Jersey and like the sheriff's deputy trying to protect his family and build a community in a post-apocalyptic world that's been overrun by zombies. These characters wouldn't have found their way into our lives had Cable not come up with compelling, emotionally engaging stories. And Cable's forced the broadcast networks to raise their game. In the past 10 years, the broadcast networks have hit back with their own inventive storytelling, compelling characters, thrilling production values. And going forward, digital content will have the same opportunity as cable to shift forward toward longer form, higher quality storytelling and to ante up for all content producers. But while the future belongs to great long form stories, digital is also an opening for new frontiers for great storytelling in small packages. Short form takes on a different mindset and in the right hands, it can be liberating. I remember what it was like starting out as a news reporter and feeling stifled because I only had a few minutes to tell the facts, the who, what, when, how, and why. But my friend Bernard Goldberg, who's a brilliant reporter, thought something differently. He told me that he found it exciting and challenging to convey the who, what, when, how, and why in only a few minutes, as you had to be incredibly creative. You needed to tell a story, not just the facts. Well, Bernie was on to something. Today, we're seeing that kind of excitement around digital entertainment. It's no wonder we're starting to see top actors, directors, and producers migrating to the digital space. Take Wigs, a YouTube channel with short form scripted series developed by Black Swan producer John Avnet. Wigs offers edgy, thought provoking stories about women and showcases female talent. Major actresses like Julia Stiles, Jennifer Garner, and Virginia Madsen have starring roles. Webisodes on wigs are generally eight minutes long or less, but they're considering producing webisodes of up to 22 minutes. And it's a, in its first few months, wigs has pulled in more than 16 million views and more than 87,000 subscribers. So all of this is to say whether short form or long form, the challenge for content creators like you and me is to raise the bar for storytelling, to weave narratives so wonderfully inventive that everything else seems too simple, to write scripts so fresh that everything else seems stale, to show worlds viewers have never seen or imagined, whether it's the glamorous world of Sex in the City or the scary world of Real Housewives of New Jersey, and to develop twists and turns that would make Homeland look predict predictable. Our challenge is to challenge ourselves 
and our audiences to not accept the ordinary, but to seek out the extraordinary. We need to be bold and different, adventurous and original, to create the next big hit, not just for a channel or a network, but for the world. In this giant frictionless sea I described, each of us has an opportunity to do it. Minnows, whales, or a whole new species of fish. The vast ocean of storytelling is there to be discovered. So that's our opportunity, and that's our challenge. It's the challenge that drew someone like me to, from cable and broadcast to Condé Nast, a 103-year-old magazine publisher. Condé Nast, as you know, is the home to some of the world's most iconic brands, more than 20 in the US alone. I can't think of a more exciting place to be than this company at this moment. Even though Condé Nast hasn't always been in the filmed entertainment business, it's always been about great stories. It's always known how to hit that combination of story well-conceived and well-executed. Now, as some of you may have known, Brokeback Mountain, Eat, Pray, Love, Argo, and Shattered Glass, actually written by Buzz, just to name a few, are movies that all started as stories in our magazines and were taken to the screen by other companies. Going forward, we intend to take our stories to movie, TV, and digital screens ourselves. So let me conclude by saying there's never been a better time, not even at the start of the cable revolution or a greater demand for content creation than there is today. There have never been more opportunities to reach different audiences all at once. I'm incredibly excited about the challenge ahead, and I suspect all of you are too. So now I'm gonna bring out Buzz and we'll do a little bit of Q&A. And for any of you who came in late, Buzz is one of the writers for Vanity Fair. You know, Dawn, um, a lot of publishers, as you know, have tried to move into this arena. They've tried to move into film entertainment in the past. It has not worked. You know, synergy kind of becomes a dirty word. Hmm. What, what does make you so confident that Condé Nast, although it is a great treasure of storytelling, what makes you think that Condé Nast entertainment can succeed where others have failed? Well, I think all media businesses, and, and I've been talking to a lot of CEOs of, of media companies in film, television, and publishing, I think we all have to look at the 360 of, of our world right now. I mean, the lines are really blurring, and um, I think it's going to be harder to really differentiate where a magazine starts and where video content begins, because we all know that on um, our tablets, we're going to be able to get video as part of our magazine. So um, in, in that sense, I think everybody's starting to look at IP rights differently, even producers, content producers. You know, having had several meetings here, I hear people talking about it more often than ever before. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's a huge commitment on the part of Condé Nast and on the Newhouse uh, company. I think everybody realizes that this is going to be a core strategy for their company moving forward. We've had the opportunity to hire some of the best talent in the business. You know, we've got Jeremy Steckler running our film group and Michael Klein running our reality group. And we just hired Fred Santarpia from Vivo to help us run our uh, digital group. So I think the financial support is there from the company. I think that the editors and publishers are excited about this. And I think the world is changing. And in terms of storytelling as king, what does make Condé Nast so special? You know, it's so funny. I think Cy Newhouse just looked at these magazines as, as an art form. Um, you know, it was all about the story. It was all about the picture. It was all about, you know, making sure that it was the, the best quality. And so it never was really about, you know, the, the budgets and, and, and it, it, the editors had the freedom to really sort of have a vision and then, and then play it out. And I think, you know, we've seen so many films. I mean, there are probably 20 or 30 films that have come from these magazines just in the past, you know, decade alone. Right. And, you know, when we were dinning, having dinner last night, as you pointed out, uh, the Adams Family came from a cartoon in The New Yorker. E. Praying <laughs> Love came from Allure. 
uh, magazine, you right. know, my brilliant shattered glass came from Vanity, <laughs> That's right. uh, Vanity Fair. As and what strikes mind. me, their beautiful mind yeah, came from Vanity Fair. So what strikes me is uh, there is storytelling coming from not the usual players, but from all the different brands that the that the company yeah. produces. In fact, Argo is being is being released now, and that's from Wired. So you know, it's not just one of the magazines. I think. If the magazines are in so many different categories right. um, that they cover a lot of different topics. Well, content, this is one of the things I think people do wonder about. You know, you see the big blockbusters on, on movies, television, um, um, you know, performance and, and values um, have gotten much better in terms of the way things are filmed. Will content made for digital platforms, will it ever have that kind of truly high budget feel as we know it today, I mean, are we are we ever going to see kind of the blockbuster special effects that uh, we've come to uh, to expect on well, virtually other digital platforms? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of TV and film producers and directors are starting to move into the digital space. You know, Anthony Zeiger did a high budget project called um, Cybergeddon uh, for Yahoo. Um, Halo, which I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not or public, but um, I heard Halo is going to cost somewhere between five and ten million dollars, and that's Microsoft um, and uh, Machinima. I mean, that's a pretty significant budget for a film, and they, it's about the business model. I mean, they're figuring out different business models that I think are going to allow us to see more expensive content being made. Um, what I found fascinating uh, about about hearing um, all of the different producers here is a lot of the companies are starting digital divisions. And you hear about what YouTube's doing, and I'm sure many people here heard Robert Kinsel yesterday. I mean, they're really looking to, to up the ante, to see higher quality content. And so if we can figure out the business model and there are enough places to distribute it, um, I think we're going to see more of it. And don't forget, we don't have the same expenses that we do in television or in right. film to make right. the content. So. Right. And I think I should point out, I mean, a Condé Nast Entertainment is not simply limited to acquiring Condé Nast properties, no. so to speak. No, so we're the, doing, so and we're partnering awesome. with a lot of people, you know, a lot of film right. producers and producers, and we're not going to make right. all of our own content on our own, so. And what platforms, you're across all platforms, I also assume, whether it's television, whether it's digital, or, yeah. or, or whether it's film. Mm -hmm. You know, you pointed to that incredible graph when, when cable was nascent, and people really got it because they had terrible television reception. You've seen how it's taken over. It took cable, but it took cable over 20 years to command the kind of share that it does, to command a greater share of you know, television viewing. I don't think we ever thought that would happen, television viewing than the broadcast networks. I mean, do you ever think that digital video, seriously, is it ever going to surpass TV viewing? And if so, is it going to take 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, or, or 30 years? I mean, what do you think? You're, well, you're, in the, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I can only speak a little bit about the U.S. audience. I mean, the U.S. audience, uh, the average person in the U.S. watches 35 hours of television a week. So um, you'd compare that to about two hours of digital video content viewing. So right now, there is a big divide. However, I think we're going to see several things start to happen. First, you're going to start to see that um, the technology is going to advance we're going to have you know, more ways that we can see our content, not just up on the big screen, and not just on our tablet, but also on our mobile. Um, so you'll be able to ha have access to longer form content in more places. And then you've also got the Hulus and, the, you know, and all of the Netflixes and, and everybody else who's announcing really more long form content, both original and acquired. So I think it's going to be so easy to get longer form content that you're going to start to see a switch. I mean, I think if people are watching on their computer, they're going to probably watch shorter form content for a while. But the tablet viewing right now, um, two thirds of the people viewing video on their tablet are watching long form video. And right. I think we're only going to see that go up. Right. And I, and I assume stream, there'll also be much more streaming into your flat screen TV. Yeah. And, and That's all happening, and plus the quality of the content is going to get so much better. Well, let me ask you that. I mean, I would argue maybe it's wrong. I mean, television is in its golden age. Television, in many ways, as an art form, has equipped, equipped uh, you know, for film. You, you, you showed examples, whether it's The Sopranos, whether it's uh, Homeland, whether it's Game of Thrones, you know, whether it's Downton Abbey. Why has that happened, do you think? 
Um, I think, you know, cable, the, the, there's just been such um, a rebirth of, right. of Is creativity. it more money invested, do you think? I think it's creativity. Mm -hmm. I think really, in some cases, um, it's money, but more likely than not, I think people have to be scrappier on cable, and so that they've done more in some ways with less. Right. Um, I think it's creative people pushing themselves and being really inventive. And I think we have to all say to ourselves now, it's such a crowded landscape. How are we ever going to get noticed, um, be it either in the digital space or on, on, on a channel? You know, I, this, somebody told me the statistic, and it's really, it's really amazing. When you think about when television producers, um, at least back in the US, when there were three or four television networks were producing content, they were really just producing content for, them, for, their, for their 150 million people in their country. Right. Um, and then cable started, and there were you know, many more channels, and they were producing content for maybe you know, 300 million people in the US, as over the years you know, we've obviously grown. But now, you're really producing content for 2.5 billion people. You're right. producing content that has to be more global in its scope. Right. Um, it's got to reach a broader audience. It has to be louder and noisier to get noticed. And the challenge is really on. I mean, I use that word in, 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 in my speech a few times, but it's really the truth. I mean, the challenge is really great. But in the end, and I obviously am biased, but it goes back to storytelling, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. it go back to the ability to tell a great story with great characters? All those TV shows that I've cited have, have both, do they? Right. Not? And, you know, I think that uh, part of why we're seeing, you know, sort of this, this whole, you know, all, all of these shows that everyone's talking about, like Downtown Abbey or like a Homeland or, or even Game of Thrones, it's just different. It's interesting. We haven't seen that before. Right. Right. You know, people talk about success, and I think it's a good question. How will we measure successful content when success can take, you know, so many different forms, whether it's quality, whether it's, you know, monetary? Are we still sort of going to play or go by the current standard of you know, viewership size and ad revenues? Okay. Well, critical acclaim, is that going to determine success? Or is there some you know, new metric, like it's tweets per show or something like that? Well, I mean, having run uh, in several networks, I, I can say that you get different kinds of hits from different kinds of shows. You right. know, obviously, you need the shows that are going to bring in the viewers because you've got to make it uh, you know, a business model that, that works for, for everybody. But there are always going to be shows that are you know, critical darlings, and you keep those on the network for a while. I mean, I, I, when I was you know, at uh, UPN before we formulated the CW, we had a show called Veronica Mars, and it starred mm -hmm. Kristen Bell. Yes, yes. And Kristen Bell was an absolute star in the making, no doubt about it. The show was so well written. It had such a huge fan base. And when we merged these two networks, I mean, the fans rented like Ferris wheels and put them up in front of our office and took, you know, play, paid for planes to, to go across with signs saying, don't lose Veronica Mars. And so, you know, you keep shows on for different reasons. But I think at the end of the day, it's got to be about money. It's got to make business sense. And we're all going to have to figure out what those metrics are as we're changing our entire system, our ecosystem, you know. We're talking about shows starting off maybe, you know, being produced for the digital space, maybe with Netflix or, or Yahoo, and then maybe migrating on to, you know, cable networks or broadcast networks, as opposed to vice versa. So I think we're going to see a lot of different things. We're talking about making content in the digital space and then syndicating it into the digital space and in, in, to other territories or to other, uh, to other digital companies. So. You know, everyone's trying to figure it out, and I think really in the next few years it will become crystal clear. It's a global world. It's a global network. Will there be more push to create television shows, for example, that do appeal, you know, worldwide, that are not necessarily indigenous to the United States? You could argue that Mad Men is very part almost of American culture. Oh, will yeah. you concentrate on that more? Well, I think everybody has to. I mean, I, I was having... Uh, I was having dinner with several producers, and everyone was talking about scripted uh, formats that they bought in other territories that are now being adapted to the U.S., not unlike Homeland. I mean, I think that's becoming, mm -hmm. it's, it, the world is just so small. It used to be that so much of the U.S. content would go out to the world. Now, so much of the world's content is coming into the U.S., and 
literally it's just one, you know, sort of, it's, it's, it's one world um, for all of us. And it's the good and the bad. I mean, the great news is if you're, if you're a content creator, that means that you have that many more uh, outlets to have your content seen. And at the same time, you know, you've got new ways to make different revenue. So, so more of a possibility like in Homeland, which I think was made in Israel originally, right. and then specifically adapting it could be the U.S. market, it could right. be to the European market, it could be to any different it's, type it's happening, of market. It's happening everywhere. So right. I think that, um, you know, time will tell, but uh, I think digital will become a much bigger player. I, I would say that even when we'll be back here next year, you know, digital will probably have taken on, you know, even a, a stronger um, presence, and I think television will continue to thrive, and and films, you know, will mm. will of course always be there. But mm. it's interesting to even see films now being co-released in the theaters and on demand. So I yes. think you know right. everything is really shifting. And when I said we're going through an extreme makeover, you know, I meant that really in every imaginable way. Now, on a, on a personal note, you've had an incredible uh, career. You know, at, whether it's at CW, whether it's at, at, at Lifetime. Uh, you're a mother of four, you have a wonderful husband. What would possess you to take on this type of job where obviously, in a sense, you're starting from scratch? What is it that, 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 that drives you to do this? You know, I think like so many other producers who constantly look at the magazines and see all the potential, I just said, wow, all of these titles, we have 80,000 articles archived. Right, I mean, it's, right. we've hired all these readers to just go in and read, um, read articles. And it's amazing to find that even a lot of producers in the Hollywood community have optioned articles that were, you know, a 1975 article from The New Yorker. So there's just so much opportunity there. And we all know it's hard to come up with original ideas. You know, I, I work with Les Moonves, and he used to say, you know, there are only nine ideas in the world. It's all about execution. Right. But, um, you know, being able to have that much content and, and, and that many ideas and characters sort of at your fingertips, I think, is a great advantage to starting right. Right. a division like that. Well, it's a very small cog uh, in the Condé Nast machine. It's a pleasure and a joy to have you be the head Thank you so of entertainment. Much. Thank you, and I just want to mention in a few minutes, uh, Jason Kyla uh, from Hulu uh, will be the next uh, keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.